All right, everyone, so I'm gonna be calling this meeting to order. Now I know what your first question probably is. Emma, why do you look so horrible tonight? Well, the role of Emma Guest Gonzalez tonight will be played by uh, Jerry Wilco, because Emma is running late, she will be here eventually. Our two vice presidents could make it, so go down the chain of command, and that puts me in charge of this, uh, this meeting. Uh, yes. Uh, treasure is spelled in the agenda, but that's all right. We couldn't afford the A. Budgets is tight these days. Um, so, yeah, thank you uh, for everyone for coming out on a, a very lovely spring evening here in Tribeca. Uh, and of course, thank you to the Soho Photo Gallery uh, and everyone involved for hosting us this evening. Um, so, first I'm going to uh, introduce uh, Bob Gelber, who has helped arrange this and many other meetings, and he will uh, introduce our host, uh, who will be uh, welcoming us to this venue, so Bob. Uh, so welcome, it is really great to see so many of you here tonight. This is one of our highest numbers registered pre-COVID, uh, which is terrific. So anyway, let us begin. So, Deborah Gilbert, currently Regional Director for American Photographic Artists New York Chapter, is an award-winning photographer whose work has appeared in the New York Times, Parade, and many other publications around the world. For over 20 years, she utilized art fairs to market her work. Before that, she was a photo editor at Image Bank and a clown with Ringling Brothers and Barlow and Bailey Circus. <laughs> All jobs that are more alike than they are different. So you can imagine why I love Debbie as soon as I met her. She began producing large scale and small scale charity events in high school, and since that time expanded into exper experiential marketing events and has produced over 1,200 events of every description for both nonprofit organizations and for companies. Her favorite side hustle is writing articles and cheeky episode recaps of British TV shows for PBS 13 WNET. She publishes the free photography e-newsletter, Develop, and is a member of Soho Photo Gallery, New York City's longest operating co-op uh, photography gallery. Uh, you can follow her at Instagram, uh, message her if you'd like a free subscription to Develop, where she is an erratic poster. Uh, <laughs> poster, it said poster. Uh, yes, yes. She, Right. So yes, whatever. It's been a long day. Uh, but before I bring Debbie up, I just want to thank Debbie so much because the connection was given to me to contact Debbie to get in here, and she welcomed us with open arms. For those of you, about 20 of us who were here at 4.30, uh, she had two amazing photographers who gave us a run of all the different exhibits that are in this building and they would love to do other programs with us in the future, or if you have clients that are interested in photography. So Debbie, thank you, and Mike is yours. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. And welcome everyone to Soho Photo Gallery, and as you may have noticed, it's called Soho Photo Gallery, but it's not in Soho, it's in Tribeca. You can think of us as the gallery equivalent of the chocolate egg cream, which has no eggs and no cream. Um, so, uh, but you'll notice if you, you know, go to any galleries around the city, you'll notice that we are very different. Um, walking through the, the doors of Soho Photo Gallery, it's like stepping back in time to pre-gentrified New York. You know, when artists ran wild downtown uh, before it was taken over by you know all the Wall Street people. Um, this is ungentrified, this looks just the way it looked when this gallery was put together back in the early 80s. And this you know, loft was built by the artists. It was not pinned by contractors. You go into other galleries and it, you're just in a white box, you know, sanitized for your protection. Um, but this is a unique experience um, for your clients. <coughs> and also, because it's a not-for-profit gallery, a co-op gallery, as, as Bob mentioned, the longest running co-op gallery in New York. Um, 
it's, it's an incubator for talent. And so your clients are getting to see the work of, of people who, uh, it's fabulous work, but the commercial galleries wouldn't take a chance on it. So basically it's like you're going to the public theater and seeing someone's gonna be a, a star on Broadway you know, in two years, but you're seeing them, you're seeing them first. And so that's um, what's very, one of the things that's very unique about the gallery. And we really wanna work with you and we can put together uh, programs for your clients, for your tours that come through, whether it is uh, having you know, one of the photographers who's exhibiting give a talk to your people when they come through, and that's something you don't get in a commercial gallery. The people who are exhibiting are members of the gallery, and they may be sitting, you know, minding the gallery when you come through, and if you let us know in advance, we can work with you and make sure that um, something like that is available to you. We can also create um, other experiential events for your people coming through, whether it's an instructional photo walk. Uh, so your, uh, your tours can learn a little bit about photography, even if it's about getting better pictures out of, your, uh, out of their iPhone, whether so they can get great pictures of their trips to take home. It's something that everyone who's traveling wants to get home and have really great pictures. Um, so there's all kinds of things you can do, and we'd love to work with you. And uh, because we are a not-for-profit gallery, we're like any other cultural institution post-COVID. You know, we're struggling a bit, and so we really, you know, it's, it's great for you, and it's also helpful for us to bring new people into the gallery. And also, one thing that, uh, that Pat made mention of, uh, she said, I forgot to tell them that when they bring people through, all of, the week, all of the work that's hanging in the gallery is for sale, and it's all affordable art. It's not, you know, this, you know, when you go into these big galleries, I, I don't, I'm just saying the big galleries, but you know, you go in and, <laughs> and there's, this, there's the snooty, there's the snooty uh, girl behind the desk who like looks you up and down and judges you like you don't belong there. We don't do that. We're we're friendly here, so we can give your we can give your tours an experience, a true New York experience when they come, especially your your, your travelers who are coming from overseas. We can give them something really special. Um, so I'm going to now hand over the mic to Tom O'Connor. Tom O'Connor is the president of the gallery, and um, uh, I, I, I'm only a new member, so I was never here during an election, so I didn't get a chance to vote for him. But I would have voted for him <laughs> if I was, if I was, if I was. Uh, and he's a fabulous photographer as well as a terrific president. And uh, oh, here's okay. Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Deborah has managed to make all the points that I was going to make. <laughs> so I don't really have much to say other than on behalf of the 105 members of the gallery, we welcome you this evening. We're very pleased that you came. You see the work on the walls. You see the uh, uniqueness of this gallery, and I hope that you will remember it and come back. I had a couple of points. First of all, yes. Founded in 1971 by some photographers, including photographers from the New York Times. Uh, it, we call ourselves one of the oldest uh, member-run galleries for photography in the United States. There are a couple of places out on the West Coast that might be a little older, but we don't talk about that. <laughs> so that's number one. Number two, we have been in this space for 43 years. Wow. And when we, uh, not my, me personally, I was a kid at that point. Uh, <laughs> when the lease was signed on this space, it was a poultry warehouse, which meant that there were chickens and eggs. And we, the, the lease was signed and volunteer members, probably about 60 members, spent five months coming in, cleaning it up, putting in walls, putting in two bays upstairs. The wonderful bathroom that you will see, the restroom that you will see if you haven't seen it already. Uh, the only other thing that you might have, oh, two questions. What's with the, uh, this diamond plate steel flooring? That was here when it was a poultry warehouse. And it was because they used forklift trucks to move things around and they needed really solid floors so the trucks wouldn't fall through the, to the basement. 
That's why we have these floors. And I would say we're sentimental, but we're also, it would be a major investment to try to redo the floors, so we're fine with that. The only other thing I would say is, why is it Soho Photo when you're in Tribeca? The original Soho Photo was on Prince and West Broadway, which was in Soho. And as time went on, the gallery expanded, they needed a bigger space for a while, we were on 13th Street, which was at the time didn't have its own little niche name, and it was just, that's eh, the village. So would it have been better to call us the Greenwich Village Photo Gallery? It didn't have the same pizzazz as Soho Photo Gallery, so we stuck with that. Uh, and as Debbie said, when you come in here, you are going to be greeted by a person who will like you and be warm to you and, and won't try to assess how much money you have to spend. So, uh, and very likely when you come in, our host for the day will be someone who has work on the walls and can talk endlessly about their work and answer questions. So I'm glad you're here. This is a lovely evening. This is the largest crowd we've had in the gallery for some time, too, be because of COVID. I'm glad to see you all here. Thank you very much. And who gets the mic? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, one thing I do want to add is that I know we have a few people here who are new member applicants that we were going to interview after the meeting. So if uh, that is you, please stick around at the meeting codes and we'll, board members here, we'll uh, meet you up here at the front. Um, so I'm going to give the uh, president's report uh, presented by me instead of Emma. So one thing that Emma wanted to uh, mention is uh, their city guide, New York Dapper Media, does an annual Women in Tourism Awards. Last year, Emma was the recipient of that award. This year's winner is, I think it's here, the Susan Birnbaum. So. <laughs> ceremony honoring uh, the women in the various categories like attractions, etc. A woman, um, Susan won in the tour guide uh, category is going to take place at City Winery, uh, just up the, uh, the waterfront here on May 9th, is that correct? Right. May 9th. And it is, the event is open, like a nice little luncheon is open to the public. You can buy tickets on the City Guide website. Uh, again, it will be sending a few official representatives there to congratulate Susan and all she's done uh, to represent our industry and tour guiding in general. So just wanted to congratulate Susan and let people know if they want to attend a luncheon to honor women working in various aspects of New York tourism, May 9th at City Winery. It was a lovely little lunch. Um, but one thing Emma also wanted me to mention was uh, a few weeks ago, we sent out a survey to the members to kind of uh, take your temperature, see how everything was kind of going, and learn how we can do better for you as an organization. So on behalf of the board, I do want to thank all the members who filled out that survey. It was actually quite a lot of responses, uh, which was uh, very good to see because, you know, this even predates COVID, but we always try to figure out what makes a guy join organic and what makes a guy not join organic. And one thing we kind of asked guys, we would ask around, like, oh, why? We see you all the time, why don't you join Gannick? And there was a concern, um, like, oh, Gannick seems too clicky, it doesn't seem opening to outsiders. Um, and we, you know, really worked, I think this particular board and some of the previous ones have worked to try and get away from that and be a more opening and welcome, you know, kind of organization. And, you know, one thing I will say, though, in that regard is, you know, sometimes when you see an organization like this that is volunteer run, and you say, like, I keep seeing the same dozen or so faces doing every way, and I don't like that. Like, there's an easy fix to that, folks. You can, <laughs> you can throw your hat into the ring and, uh, and you know, become one of the people that you see doing things. We're always, obviously, any of the committees are always looking for, you know, new volunteers and things like that. But uh, I do want to summarize a few things that we got from the survey, because, you know, the results are obviously kind of interesting. So uh, the first question was, are you currently employed as a guide? Now, not all of our members are. Some are retired and still retain membership because they like the camaraderie or uh, they might come back someday, but it was 74% still currently employed by a guide, but only 47% of uh, members have guiding as their primary source of income. Um, and then one of the questions was, what percentage of your income is generated by guiding? Um, half, literally half of that, the number one response, 40% was one to 20%. 
So most of our members, it seems, are people who are very much part-time, maybe that's the way they want to be, maybe they want to go more, and then about 10% was 20 to 40%, so half of our membership makes 40% or less their income from guiding. So we have a lot of part-timers here, and uh, we, you're looking to become a full-timer, obviously that's something we want to kind of help along. Age range, not surprisingly, the largest answer here was 61 to 70, this is an organization that skews um, older, and you know, we've got some complaints that we want to make the organization younger. My personal guesstimate on that as someone who is 43 years old and is among one of the younger members of the organization is older people just have more free time. Younger people are juggling multiple jobs, families, children. Um, you know, we do have members who have children and families and you don't see them here because they're doing the family stuff. But, um, you know, we're always looking for more diversity both in age and other things. So um, now, one of the questions was, key to us, what features of Gannon do you appreciate most and that keep you involved in the organization? Not surprising to us, fam tours was the number one thing. It is the most popular benefit uh, that we offer, followed by these meetings and the great opportunities and venues it provides, um, followed by you know, various events that involve networking with other guides. And if you, you know, both these meetings and the fam tours, if any of you have been to a lot of these, you know that actually one of the best benefits is to network with your fellow guides. So in general, it seems networking is something that people are really looking to get out of the organization. So one of the other questions here was, um, oh, like, uh, what words, you know, things you could improve? Uh, one thing that wasn't a majority response, but did come up enough that I felt it was worth noting was uh, a lot of multilingual guides, guides who speak multiple languages, you know, noted that this organization, for those of you who know the deep dive history of Gannick, when it was founded, uh, in, the, in the early 1970s, it was a multilingual guides organization that eventually evolved to include all types of tour guides, um, and that they felt that we needed to do a better job kind of representing guides who speak multiple languages, and that is something that we are definitely working on. Gannick used to have a, a, a fairly active multilingual guides committee, and we're looking to figure out a way to bring that more up. We are very much also looking for somebody to volunteer to chair such a subcommittee. Uh, um, but yeah, people looking at some of the uh, things here, mostly a lot of um, kind of complaints. It was one person, apropos of uh, filming this, someone who said, oh, you know, I think some of the uh, techno technical quality of some of the videos you shoot and stuff like that could be better. And I won't disagree, but I would also add that everything we do is the nature of Gannick is, again, volunteer run. Uh, you know, we do have a, a very limited budget and that's only gotten more so over time. So like when you see the videos of these meetings and other Gannick events that are on our YouTube and stuff like that, it's being filmed with my iPhone on a tri very cheap tripod that I bought on Amazon. And that's just because that's the easiest way to do it. If we could afford professional equipment, we would absolutely do that. And you know, we really appreciate you guys kind of sticking with us because both involving newer members coming in and members going out in the three years of COVID, we kind of had a, a net loss of about 80 members. Um, it, the number of members we lost during COVID was well over 100, but we gained a lot of new members, so the net is about a loss of 80 members versus where we were this time in uh, 2019, uh, right before everything went very, very sour uh, for the tourism industry. So those of you who have stuck around and have joined since, we really appreciate you because you guys make it possible to do what we do. Um, but yeah, I just want to give a note if you, if you feel like I think this committee could be doing better in this regard or I, I think there should be a voice on this committee who's speaking to this aspect of the industry or these type of tour guides aren't, I don't see represented in the way Gannick presents our industry. We need you to step up and be that voice. When I first joined Gannick, it was May of 2016, coming up on five years ago. And when I first joined, as someone who spends way too much time on social media, I thought, Organic social media could use somebody running it uh, a little bit differently. And so I asked if I could be that person, and the rest is kind of history. So, you know, if you think like I could do this better than the person who's doing it now, we will not be insulted. Please, you know, step <laughs> up. Uh, we are always happy for new blood. And I would also mention um, that this is an election year for Gannett. It's a little too early to be, you know, talking about that stuff. But th this fall, we will have an election for the next executive board of Gannett. So, again, the leadership is the people who step up. But yeah, thank you for filling out that uh, survey. It does help us know kind of what's working and what's not because 
I, I you know, can only speak for myself as someone who's on his third term on the board. I think the last few years the board have tried to be more listening and you know, trying to hear out uh, the criticism, both the positive stuff that we should like and sometimes the negative stuff because that's how we grow as an organization. Gannett is a membership organization. It's not just an organization of nine board members and you know, uh, the two dozen other people who volunteer on various committees. We are a member of, at this point, around 310 working tour guides. Uh, and we could not do this without you, so uh, thank you guys uh, for, for that. Um, next thing I want to move to is uh, some uh, not so exciting news. Uh, so many of you are familiar with longtime member uh, Matthew Cummings, who's uh, worked in guiding for a very long time, has been a member of various committees over the years. So um, I, this was brought to our attention by Jared Goldstein. Jared, are you here? Oh, Jared's not here. Okay, but I, I want to thank Jared for bringing this to our attention. So um, many, many years ago, Matt Cummings, as I said, had some sort of surgery on his leg, um, and that injury, a uh, long-time leg injury, had become infected, and apparently uh, part of Matt's leg is going to have to be amputated. Oh, wow. And while he does intend to return to guiding, uh, he obviously, both for the surgery and the long-term uh, recovery after the surgery, will be missing a lot of work. So for those of you who are longtime members, uh, newer members, we do this thing when we have a member who's in uh, very desperate need, we pass the hat, it'll actually be a bag, I didn't bring a hat with me, um, and you can give whatever you wish, uh, doesn't ha you don't have to give anything, but we appreciate any donations, and Gannick then matches all the donations we get. So say if we ended up getting um, $500 in donations, Gannick will put it out of its own pockets, an additional $500, and then that amount will be given in a check uh, to Matthew Cummings on behalf of the membership. Um, I forget what I was going to say about that. If you can't uh, give money tonight or we're watching on YouTube later on, you can send money to us via PayPal. Our PayPal address ID is finance at gannick.org. Uh, finance at gannick.org. You can send uh, PayPal to us. And we'll be kind of taking in donations uh, for the next two weeks, and after that, we'll add up what we have and again, put in our own money, and a check will be mailed to uh, Matthew with our best wishes and support on his recovery. All right, so that is that. So I'm gonna go grab the, um, the bag. Actually, Bob, if you could help me with that. It's the black bag there. I think there's a little bit of money that I already put in it. So we're just gonna kind of pass this around the room. Um, if you want to write a check, you can throw a check in there or cash, and when it's, um, uh, just kind of keep passing it back in the, uh, in the room. Um, let me just double check if there was anything else I would want to talk about. Uh, oh, the last thing actually I, I wanted to mention is we had uh, last week, and I want to thank Ann McDermott who's sitting there at the back of the room, our current membership chair. Um, prior to COVID, we tried to do two new member orientations a year. These were events, uh, this idea first came from a former membership chair, Amada Anderson, where we would welcome newer members and kind of help them understand what the various committees do, help them meet each other, help them network. And this obviously got kind of lost in the shuffle of, uh, of COVID, but we had the first live one uh, since COVID last week. And I want to thank all the members, newer members who showed up for that, as well as committee volunteers. Uh, we will be doing another one of those in the fall. We always are kind of looking to, uh, to do that. Um, and last thing I will mention is I do see Patrick Bringley there. So uh, Patrick Brinley is obviously uh, reveling in the, uh, the glory of his new book about his days as a security guard working at the, uh, the Met. Um, and, and he will be signing copies of the book. If anyone brought their books with them, uh, following the meeting when everybody's kind of you know uh, chatting, if you want to go up, he will be happy to sign your copy. All right. Um, so we're going to, uh, to move on. So I'm going to, uh, um, when Bob's done, I'll introduce him. We'll be going to our, our guest uh, speaker. But does anyone have any questions about anything while we're passing the bag? No? Okay. Always good when it's self-explanatory. So I'll go around the bag and I will give this to uh, Bob Gelber, who is going to introduce our lovely uh, speaker for this evening. So thank you. All right. Watch that show. So um, I have waiting almost two and a half years to get our guest speaker. Uh, I met Yuki Oda uh, when I was privileged to take part in an event that um, actually
actually, I did her Soho Memory Project as an app. And it took me through all the parts of Soho that Miyuki had grown up in, and she tells her story to keep what Soho was alive because we all know what Soho is today. Design of bibs and very expensive housing. So, Yoki Uda is an archivist, writer, and founder of the Soho Memory Project, a nonprofit organization that celebrates and preserves the history of Soho as a New York City neighborhood. Yuki was New York Preservation Archives 2021 Preservation Award honoree and a nominee for the 2023 Gannick Apple Award for Outstanding Achievement in Preservation. In 2015, she was named the Memory Keeper of Soho by the New York Times. Yuki has written and lectured widely on Soho history, and she still lives in the building where she formed her earliest Soho memories. Please welcome Yoki El.
buildings were considered outmoded and powerful forces felt the city should be better off with a highway or housing complex instead of the architectural treasures that still stand today. Soho Memory Project collects um, archival documents in many forms that tell the story of how Soho's magnificent built environment uh, was preserved by the artist activists, um, making it the first instance of widespread um, adaptive reuse in New York City, and um, also in the formation of a tight-knit artist community that was formed along the way. And so again, what is Soho Memory Project? Soho Memory Project is a document archive, it's a website, a mobile museum, a community partner, a walking tour, and a digital archive. So the Soho Memory Project archive uh, contains a wide variety of resources on the artistic, cultural, social, political, and urban history of the area that is now called Soho. Uh, with a focus on the decades between 1960 and 1980 when it was a thriving uh, artist community. And in, in addition to presenting first-hand uh, stories and first-hand accounts, the archive contains source materials including photographs, maps, municipal documents, academic papers, newspapers, magazine articles, oral histories, books, websites, films, and video. So that is the entirety of the Soho Memory Project <laughs> paper document archive, and it's really not a good idea to keep paper archives around cats. Um, but it's scheduled, it's, it's there because all together, because it's scheduled to be picked up by the New York Historical Society on May 2nd where it will become part of their archive and uh, it will be preserved and made accessible to the public. Um, yeah. So when I began collecting these um, documents from the Soho old timers, um, AKA the parents of the kids that I grew up with, um, I didn't know exactly where the documents would end up, but luckily New York Historical agreed to partner with me and the papers will be kept safely long past my lifetime, um, which is very comforting to me. So what else is the Home Memory Project? It is a website, a resource for digital materials about Soho centered around first-hand accounts or Soho stories, as I, as I call them. And um, can you see if this tech works? And I can just show you the website itself, yes. So, um, Soho Memory Project website is designed to be a radical. So, on the home page, you always get the latest story that I've written um, or interviewed. And if you go to that story, you can read the story uh, on the left hand side. And then on the right hand side, um, there are related tags. In this case, related tags, um, places, people, um, all that are mentioned in the body of the story. So if you click on a related place, I'm going to click on food, which was a restaurant that was started by artists in Soho in 1972 or 1, um, you can have a page for the food restaurant that has the address, related people, related stories, related archival. And these are all documents that are contained inside of the website. And so if you click on a related person, Gordon Matta Clark, the artist, who is a co-founder of the restaurant, you go to his page that has a photograph and related people to him, related places, archival documents, stories, and media, media meaning they, uh, uh, resources that are outside of the website that have to do with Gordon Matta Clark and food. Um, and then if you click on a related archival item, item um, Foods, food for bed. You go to a downloadable PDF of an archival document that I've digitized, and this is a menu from the restaurant that lists the kind of fare that they served, when they served it, and how much it cost, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then you can go on uh, to another related story, an interview with Carol Gooden, who was Gordon Matta Clark's partner and co-founder of Food, where you can read somebody else's interview with um, Carol Gooden about how she founded 
food, the food restaurant. Um, but then, you know, you can click on a tag and it, the alternative galleries tag, and it will list everything that has to do with an alternative gallery that's on the website. So stories and archival documents. And you can go on and on and on, or you can click on this hamburger menu, soon to be a pull down menu, um, and you can explore the website through stories, through people, places, archival documents, a lot of oral histories, other resources, and also this place called, this uh, page called Share Your Soho Story, where you can share your own Soho story. And if you do that, you will um, become a, hold on, a, a Soho person. Um, and this way, um, I, I would like to show that every person's Soho story is part of the collective memory of Soho. And so you are going to be included with Andy Warhol and Nikola Tesla and then Jim Stratton, who was uh, one of the members of the Soho Artists Association that advocated for historic district um, uh, designation and Shale Shapiro, who wrote the um, multiple dwelling law that applied to Soho and created lost living. Um, everybody's there um, and everybody has equal space and the right to be there. Okay, so. Uh, oh, no. I 
so admire what you all do because I have some idea of how much work goes into designing and giving a tour. So bravo to you all. Um, so instead of my continuing to give tours, I decided to do an audio tour. And I first did an audio tour for Detour, the um, San Francisco-based audio tour company, but they seem to have disappeared. Um, so I did a second audio tour with a company, a small company called Gesso. Um, and it is free and will remain free to all. Um, and this GPS triggered uh, tour interweaves, as Bob said, my personal story with the architectural and Soho, uh, social history of Soho, um, and includes firsthand accounts from artists, historians, and people who were involved in the formation of um, artists Soho in their own voices. And so I'm going to try to play for you here. Okay. Let's see if I can. I'm Yuki Oka. Um, I'm an artist, archivist. So you can hear it. It's okay. You can just look at that. I'd like to show you my neighborhood. download an app onto their phone. There are many people who don't want to do that, and they can still take the tour um, by using Safari on their phone or, you know, whatever, whatever their browser of choice. Um, so that's a little bit about what, what is included in the Soho Memory Project. Um, and so what's next? I'm not 100% sure, so. <laughs> but um, for the foreseeable future, I will be working behind the scenes on growing the digital archive component of so the Soho Memory Project site, um, which is also slated to go to the New York Historical Society in a few years' time. And I'm also consider maybe doing a book. Um, so that means I'll be less visible, but I will still be around. And um, I hope you will use Soho Memory Project um, as a resource for your research on New York City and that you'll also keep in touch um, through Instagram or through subscribing to my newsletter, which um, can be, you can subscribe through the website and it goes out four times a year. Um, so thank you for your attention. And <laughs> because then you'll have a page on the Soho Memory Project website. And um, it's not for just for people who lived in Soho back in the day. It's for anybody who has any kind of relationship to Soho. You know, I had lunch one day in Finelli's, and that's my relationship. And that's, you know, that counts too. Um, I love Finelli's. They have the best burger in the world. <laughs> 
Yes. Uh, oh, thank you so much. This was really interesting. Thanks. I'm very happy to do this. Um, so Soho was used for so many filming locations and movies. Yeah. Do you think on your website you could have like a link of movie locations? I mean, because of Ghost and uh, well, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so many movies. Yeah. Let's see. Um, what I actually have, um, and maybe I'm maybe this. The search function does not. I have a. Yeah, of course. Uh, the, ser the search function is being worked on at the moment. But I did. I wrote a story about a bunch of films that were um, filmed in Soho, and I show the locations what, where they are now, and I show clips from the films. Um, so. When the search function is working, you can just go, you know, like search it on the website and it'll come up. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Yes. Hi. Is this is this more of like a content kind of thing where you're providing content, or is there a way for you know people who are interested to get involved in something related to the film or the project? Uh, right now, it is. Mostly content, but I'm hoping that it is also participatory content in the ways that I talked about. Um, I do have, you know, it's participatory also in that there's the walking tour. Um, and I do plan to have some sort of programming. Um, I am one person, and I do a lot of other things too, so I'm trying to, you know, balance it all. But um, <laughs> Well, I suppose I could tell you, all of you would appreciate this. I um, own the rights to the Uniqlo um, exhibit that I did for their 15th anniversary, but because they've made it permanent, they need to pay me royalties, so I can maybe afford to do some programming now. Um, otherwise, it's, um, it's pretty much all uh, individual uh, donations that keep everything going. Um, I don't get paid myself, um, but maybe I will now that I have um, royalties coming in. Um, and that sort of that that will that the donations determine what I can do. Um, but I've had so many great partners in Soho, and there have been so many people who are enthusiastic and interested in um, you know how Soho has evolved and 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 how the traces of it remain today. That um, there's there's a lot of opportunity to do things. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back. So my father went to high school in Soho at uh, St. Al's. Oh. St. Al's class of 46. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And um, I'm, I joined the St. Al's face, Facebook group to see if I could get more. It was like two classes where they had men going to secretarial high school. And um, I'm going to introduce the same, your, your thing to the St. Al's website. Oh. Uh, so um, well, yes, uh, it was, interestingly, this is St. Alphonsus. This is the statue that was taken off of St. Alphonsus on West Broadway, right near here, actually, very close to here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and this is what it looked like. This is where he went to school. Mm -hmm. This is them tearing it down because supposedly the ground underneath was unstable, but, here is what, and these are people protesting. Here's what's there now. It's the Soho Grand Hotel. Oh. Yeah. Uh, I know we wouldn't have 
you know, look, you got to, let's just say it. It's a bunch of like senior citizens who say, I remember when things were, you know, like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, I was there, right? So, um, is, it is important to keep a record. You know, yeah. Yeah, it's great that, you know, I have uh, programs from the Riverside and Blue Air Theater and the Japanese Garden, which was like not 1941, but the point is, is that, uh, there, is there a group that like will oversee all of this so that we do have a bigger voice? People that do give, that do care, you know? Well, it's do interesting care. that you bring that up. Yeah. Um, I applied for a grant, which I did not get, <laughs> which proposed a New York memory project that would link together all of the groups. I'm sort of glad I didn't get it because it's a lot of work to do that, but I think that if a group of people would you know, it would, it would require more than one person. Um, but I think that that's the way, you know, I want it to be the New York Memory Project, which is just a collection of, of places um, that make up New York City. Um, so that will be something that we can all do in the future. But it's easier going digital. And if you can, yeah. yeah, and even if it's just linking all of the blogs and websites, you know, there's the Coney Island Historical Society and Astoria and, so, and if, if anybody has some energy. I just had a question for the guys. Yeah. Do you make reference to events forthcoming? Um, in your, you say you have a newsletter, right? I have a newsletter. So you make, you make announcements? I make so all we'll announcements through newsletter yeah. and um, through Instagram or Facebook oh. or I may come back again, depending on what happens. Um, so, uh, but I, but as I said, I, I am going sort of behind the scenes in the in the coming years. But I'll also try to be doing some sort of programming. I actually came here to Soho Photo to present to the Soho Arts Network the possibility of partnering with them just like a month ago in this room. Um, and so, you know, if they have opportunities where they can do like a, a group, you know, like a history walk that hits all of their organizations or something, you know, that might be something we could do. Hmm. Um, but nothing that's scheduled yet. Hmm. So you have to subscribe to me. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Uh, less a question and just an appreciation to be back out in this neighborhood again. It was actually living in Soho. I moved in in the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, that sent me on this path. And I do remember very distinctly walking to some deli that actually had decent bagels somewhere down here then. And there weren't many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, on a Sunday, nobody was on the street yet. The shopping hadn't really kicked in yet. And I was so these beautiful buildings. And all I could think of was, I gotta tell people. That's what started me as a tour guide. Hmm. Yeah, well, the And you mentioned Crosby Street. Yeah. And one little story, it's not a great one about Crosby. Please don't be insulted, but I think you'll understand it. The funny thing, you can't bring it to mind right away, Crosby Street was unique. It was the last street to really gentrify yeah. in the Soho neighborhood huh. because it was the back of the buildings facing Broadway and the buildings facing Lafayette. It always seemed to be the last one to get trash picked up. If you were homeless, you could usually find a safe, untrapped space to hide in. That was Crosby. And I remember spotting some property available and saying to my father-in-law at the time, you spot me $50,000, I'm going to guarantee you a tremendous turnover. Mm -hmm. You could see it coming. And he said, who would want to live downtown, man? <laughs> what a stupid idea. <laughs> he almost was ready to cancel the wedding. <laughs> Given that my ex-wife has all of what I've collected over the years, he probably should have done that. <laughs> but it's great to kind of do a memory lane with you down here. Thank That's you. That's great. And this is this is actually mm -hmm. what Crosby Street looked like after I moved out. <laughs> oh, it's even it's worse. Too, it's too clean. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, it was different. But however, thanks to the landmarks protection. Uh, and unfortunately, Landmarks is sort of losing its grip 
mm. right now. Yes. But, mm. but it did, um, the law did protect the buildings in Soho and they're still standing today. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Good yes. But the, Nat, the Landmarks Commission had a lot to do with this, no? It maintained Soho as it is today. Oh, yes, no, no, I'm saying right now, if there are a few, you know, there are a few protections that maybe were not approved, but back then, the um, Landmarks Preservation Commission uh, designated Soho as a historic district, and therefore it could never be torn down to make the to make the freeway that Robert Moses wanted to make, and to make the housing project that the City Club wanted to make, um, because cast iron architecture was thought of as just passe, you know, not worth saving. Um, but you know, to each his own. <laughs> um, but 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 the artists got together and um, got their important friends and in the city and at the Whitney and at MoMA to talk about how important artists were to the economy of the city and that was partially why um, why the buildings are here today. Hmm. So it is a story of activism um, as much as just a story of art. Anything else? Oh, oh, oh. Awards uh, Committee, which uh, the report will be done by new chair, uh, Sarah. Come on up, Sarah. Uh, everything had 
180 people in attendance, 72 of whom purchased their tickets, the rest were comped as nominees and as honored guests in order to get people's eyes on this and all sorts of things like that. And overall, the feeling in the room was one of warmth and excitement and the running theme in their feedback was one of feeling seen. Multiple people spoke about how their work usually doesn't garner this kind of praise and attention in their field, since many honored at the Apple Awards don't usually have awards galas in their industries or work in fields that usually don't receive outside recognition. Take a look at our Lifetime Achievement nominee, the Queen of Burlesque. Um, so if the awards is about taking a night to honor the people who make our city special and our jobs more fun, and giving them the credit they deserve, we definitely fulfilled on that promise. Most gratifying to me, and it is a little cut off here, but I will be reading it aloud. Um, we've also received some feedback from members who were previously skeptical about the event who have changed their minds after attending this ceremony. And my favorite feedback we received, this is a direct quote, this was the first awards I attended. Now, I get it. <laughs> Now, as far as media impact goes, Channel 7 Eyewitness News sent a videographer to capture parts of our ceremony for a later broadcast on that night's 11 o'clock news. Thank you to President Emma for helping to coordinate that. And from WBAI, presenter and radio host John McDonough invited Matt Baker onto his show to promote the awards, and since then, he's made a whole host of posts about it, opening us up to all of his channels. Gannick's social channels on Facebook and Instagram also saw a growth of engagement as a result of the Apple Awards. And in the future, we plan on being able to track that more meticulously with the use of a dedicated hashtag, um, as well as to generate uh, to track how much content is generated by others and how that affects traffic on our communications channels. But don't worry, I do have a more detailed breakdown than this. I just only have five minutes. Um, financially, all in all, we brought in $6,452 in income through the awards, including $2,800 in sponsorship and ad sales. Thank you, Bob, you're a wizard. Uh, $2,400 in ticket sales and an estimated $1,000 to $1,500 in in-kind donations in the form of free food for our receptions, which reflects not only the cost reduction in our production expenses, but also is a marker of accrued goodwill between these vendors and industry partners and uh, the awards committee, and more importantly, Gannick as a whole. Looking at the history of the event, these numbers are an improvement over past in-person uh, in productions and a great benchmark for which to gauge future growth and success. Expense-wise, costs came in under expected values with us spending just over $15,000. The use of Merkin Hall cost us far less than we expected in particular, which freed up, freed up some budget room to heighten production value, which also got rave reviews. Now, moving forward, we are very proud of the work we did this year and are even more excited to move forward with new goals like growing sponsorship and ticket sales, increasing organizational reach through social and legacy media, and streamlining our processes both financially and energetically. Uh, and once again, I have more on this, but we'll get there. Uh, but to conclude my official presentation, I would like to thank some people. Uh, first, Coley O'Reilly, Kevin Draper, Tony Mantioni, and Howard Birnbaum, who contribute tremendously to the success of the day with setup, breakdown, check-in, and ushering our winners safely to and from the stage. Jeremy Wilcox, who made the day run so beautifully smoothly with us as both a volunteer in those capacities and as Gannett Treasurer. Patrick Casey and Gary Dennis, who put poetry in motion for our presenters as invaluable members of the writing team. Our fabulous trophy model, Susan Solar, Vanna White wishes she could. <laughs> <laughs> and you can vote me on it. Uh, our brilliant graphic designer, Deborah Blau, and secretary and photographer, AJ Stevens, who contributed immensely to this year's awards and to our website in order to give the awards brand, cohesiveness, and panache. Our party chair, our um, our party sub chair, and food and beverage queen, and our Lee Gilbert Guiding Spirit Award uh, E, Susan Mills Birnbaum, who made magic happen in our reception. Our deputy chair and trophy treasurer Bob Gelber, who kept both of our uh, both our previous chair's head and mine on straight through the impossible, while also. Um, 
getting more show sponsors this year than in any previous year. And, of course, our fearless leader and my dear friend Matt Baker, currently off on adventure on his first ever Washington DC tour, so everybody send him good vibes, uh, who's championed the awards for most of a decade and expertly brought us back from our virtual days to in-person programming, steering our ship so beautifully through new waters there. I, have some, I know that I have some pretty impressive and massive shoes to fill, and we are all so lucky to have had him. Finally, for anyone who does want to learn more about anything I mentioned in this in-person report, I do have a 17-page full breakdown of everything that happened accessible through this QR code, which I will also have on my phone after the award, for anybody who wants to read more. Now, you might not be seeing very much of me in the next couple of months as our committee is going into our typical post-production hiatus, but I look forward to seeing much more of you in the years to come and maybe seeing you in black tie next year. Thank you very much. The awards are always filmed, and you can find the full video of the ceremony on our YouTube channel, website, etc. Um, so, if you want to, or even if you attended, you want to rewatch it uh, section, you can uh, do that. It's always is uh, recorded. I would add, actually, that was a, 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 a wonderful benefit of work at Hall was they had their own in-house videographer, which meant that we didn't have to hire an outside one. Which, uh, one less thing for the committee to do. When any time you can get built-in kind of stuff like that, it's really great. Uh, so our next committee up is going to be the Education Committee, uh, read by Chair Nina Mende. <laughs> also a previous uh, Guiding Spirit winner. <laughs> Hi, nice to always nice to be in person. And uh, I just wanna say the education, we, we call ourselves the core because we really Bob Gelber, uh, Jeremy Wilcox, uh, John Semlack back there, Lisa Puccio, uh, Minishar, myself, Susan Burbound, and Eileen Rourke, we be coming on. So we're like, it's sort of like an executive board of education because so many fam tours happen all through the year. We do like 52 a year. So, uh, and it's all because of volunteers and all kinds of exciting things. So we just want to congrats, you know, uh, all the Apple Award winners who have shared their knowledge with us, with FAM tours and professional development programs. You've probably heard this before, but our guiding spirit, Susan Birnbaum, you know, has done so many programs on the Bronx and introduced us to Wave Hill and the Bronx Brewery. And so I learned all about Arc Avenue from her. So um, give her nod, nods up for guiding spirit. Uh, also, uh, Paul Raymond. Uh, I don't know if he's here, but uh, he did a wonderful, he introduced us to the Merchant's House. We did a whole tour of the Merchant's House way back. Some of you may remember that. And also Megan Marad did a PDP, helped uh, do a PDP on social media, and she won for social media, Call Raymond for his podcast. And uh, Debbie Applegate, who's not a member, was a guest speaker and also did a fam tour before a meeting. So, really happy that they won the awards, got recognition, and I didn't write this down, but Lori Lewis was nominated, and she, uh, you know, she, she wrote a book, and she's a Gannick member, so I figured I'd give her a little plug. Uh, and congrats to Patrick Bringley, who's sitting in the back right there, who gave three wonderful tours of the Metropolitan Museum of Art this summer, before his book came out. Now his book has come out, I've been reading it, really very moving personal memoir of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So, boy, I mean, I'm gonna sign his, uh, he's gonna sign my book. <laughs> yeah, but uh, really, thanks. What? And he's here, and so stand up, Patrick, since you're here. And, yeah, let's do it. Uh, of course, Bob Gelber for tonight's meeting space, guest speaker, you can all hop, he's on, Four committees? Yeah, you know, they say 80, like 80, what, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. He's an example of that. Uh, a 
again, uh, thank you to Mar uh, March's events. Uh, the, uh, I'm going to mention these people again because they, they, they should be applauded. And if you want to know anything about horses, Robin Gar is loves horses. She did a stakes day at Thoroughbred, Thoroughbred Racing and Aqueduct Racetrack. Uh, Women's History Tour of the United Nations, Bob Gelber organized. Um, and um, you know, also uh, New York Botanical Garden Orchid Show, Susan Burbaum organized and uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire Memorial Tour. This is a tradition started by the late Lee, Lee Gelber, and it's been carried on by uh, Kevin Fitzpatrick did one year, but Robin Gar has been passing, we passed the torch to Robin Gar. She does a wonderful job of that, uh, and whoever wants to do it, it, it doesn't belong to one person, but she does a great job, and she did it on March 25th. Uh, April upcoming events, Small is Beautiful, uh, industry Relations Education, Bob Gelber, Harvey Davidson, what a team, and they're bringing all kinds of exciting things to Gannick, and we're happy to join up. Uh, and April 20th, the one and only Stand Up Andrea, so happy to have you. Back. Andrea Coyle is back, <laughs> and she's doing an Italian enclave in Williamsburg, and when Andrea does a tour, don't miss it. It's a tour you can't refuse. It's a tour you can't, it is fantastic. So uh, while FAMS are, and there are more to be announced, much more. While FAMS have been in person this month, we have a virtual library of past fans, PDPs, guest speakers. that are accessible to you as a Gannick member. So if you're somewhere else, you know, um, and you want to tune in to what's going on in New York, that's your free pass to one wonderful things it's on the website. And if you want to do a FAM tour, uh, we have a link that will really take you through all the steps. If you have any questions, of course, you can ask one of the many Education Corps members. But the proposal link is on our website. Also, you have an idea for a guest speaker. You get to introduce them. So we work with you. So uh, if you go someplace, you know. And uh, we meet the third Wednesday of the month. Sometimes it's the third week. Sometimes it's the third day. And uh, we meet on Zoom right now. We're thinking of uh, in-person meetings. And the next meeting, as far as I know, according to my calculations, is April uh, 19th at 6 p.m. So let's give a hand for all the core members uh, who work on the committee. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I would add, uh, if, yeah, if you want to look at that digital archive of like online resources, it's gannick.org slash library. Uh, it'll be accessible to you as a member when you're logged in. Some people say like, oh, you gave me this link and it says uh, unauthor, yeah, not authorized. That just means you're not logged in. There's certain aspects of the Gannick website that are for members only. So if you get that thing, just log in in the uh, upright uh, corner. Um, so our next committee up is going to be government relations, which we read by Chair Patrick Casey over here. Welcome. That's the best applause you can do on itself. <laughs> Come on! Thank you. Happy Arraignment Day, everybody! Yeah. What a time to be alive! Kevin yeah. Relations, of course I got to do that. Okay, so there has been for far too long no initiative out of Gail Brewer's office about the reintroduction of 289A. So, the Government Relations Committee found the opportunity to stir the pot just a little bit. It's a very famous constituent in Gail Brewer's district. You may have heard of him. His name is Gerald Nadler. Yes, we know, federal, but hang on. Uh, Leonel Hamanaka was able to corner him at uh, an open house function and was then able to start pummeling his office with emails and was able to get us a meeting, which happened on Monday via Zoom with his constituent coordinator. This gave us the opportunity to pitch to Mr. Nadler how he should maybe have a word with his local council member, Ms. Brewer, about a concern he should have as a resident of that New York City district and the safety of tour buses operating without guides. Really, that's tragic, that's far too dangerous. And I think, I know, we had some positive feedback from that coordinator. She actually was rather complimentary about our approach. Some said, well wait, no, no, feds can't 
influence local matters, well, if you saw the papers this weekend, every federal elected representative of the city of New York leaned on Governor Hochul's office to expand renewable energies throughout the state. So the feds can influence the state. All we did was ask the feds to influence the city. So we've started that dialogue. We'll be getting, we've been told, not much will happen until after the holidays, but they're gonna happen. And we have an entree into Mr. Nadler's office. What is commendable is that I've done Destination Capitol Hill for five years. And I've only gotten into Nadler's office once. Lionel got us this group in within a week to discuss 289A. So that's where the other thing. And our thanks. Now, we got Jerry Nadler, this is federal. What else should we be addressing? The Statue of Liberty and the nonsense going on there. You guys cannot work effectively on Liberty Island nor Ellis Island. Now that is because of redistricting out of Nadler's uh, purview, but his office, as a result of our bringing it up, has offered to extend congressional congeniality and an introduction to Daniel Goldman's office, our freshman uh, representative, and you may remember him from the impeachment hearings, ace prosecutor. So we're going to be able to have an inroad in dealing with that, a new way of perhaps leaning into the National Park Service. Uh, she was encouraging that we pursue it because as the new kid on the block, Goldman is going to be looking for spheres of influence. Why not the National Park Service when an iconic American symbol is right there in the harbor? So positive feedback on that meeting and we'll get back to, I hope, with some new information, maybe by our next uh, meeting. We'll see how it works out. Uh, we do know that the council is gonna be a little freaky as we get closer and closer to election day because of that aforementioned redistricting. Some of our council members are running for their seats again, which is completely insane and don't get me started on that. And in other news, uh, yes, we will be sending again this year another delegation of GANIC members. It'll be Matt Baker this year and where is she? Where is Miss Garrett? There you are. Uh, we'll be going to Des to Washington, advocating uh, for talking points for uh, favorable legislation in the travel industry. This is a annual event. The U.S. Travel Association organizes it. This will be, I think, our sixth year of participation. First time I'm not going this year, but I, I know our folks are going to do a wonderful job out there. So uh, until next time. Vote early, vote often, and keep in touch with your congressman. Yeah, sorry, question. I saw on the organic members only some, some uh, noise about the uh, licenses yeah. being uh, phased out. Okay, uh, really quick for those who don't have the backstory on that. Um, it was a lot of smoke and mirrors on the part of the, the Adams administration to portray themselves as being more small business friendly. And they wanted to strike out small business uh, licenses that they deemed cumbersome, difficult, archaic, antiquated. And ours was on that list. They probably put us on that list because they didn't expect anybody would push back. Well, we heard about it. The board responded with Jonathan Turner and myself meeting with uh, a special advisor to the Deputy Mayor of Economic Affairs. We went into detail of what the license was, what it entailed, how it's not expensive to maintain, how it's not arduous to maintain, and it's often, it is really the only consumer protection when it comes to seeking out a reputable, reliable guy in the city of New York. And we pushed back on the IJ, the Institute of Justice lawsuits, in that they always argue that licensing a sightseeing guy restricts freedom of speech, which has prevailed, that argument has prevailed in some really dumb courts, including Washington, DC. But in New Orleans, they got smart. That guy association pushed back, saying, no, it's a consumer protection. Every tourist has the right to know that they have an informed guide at their disposal. So with that approach, again, 
push back. They didn't expect guys to push back. Uh, we've been dropped from that list, so for now our license Great. is secure. Great. But you know what the best way to shut them up is? Ask them to review our administrative code. All of a sudden they don't want to know me. But I keep trying. We'll keep trying. We'll let you know if anything happens on that. Tony. Uh, yes. In my view, the, our restriction of the freedom of speech is what is going on at Elvis Island. Definitely brought up at Monday's meeting, and when we have Goldman's meeting, fingers crossed, that's going to be part of our talking points. Absolutely. Yes. I have a question. I knew about the Elvis Island restrictions to our giving tour, mm -hmm. but I never knew about the restrictions of uh, Liberty Island. I, I, I go there all the time for tourists. I, I'm seeing looks on people's faces. I'm sure you can all share some of your horror stories with what's going on out there. Basically, we cannot effectively tour. We are restricted to where we can go, how we can go. We're restricted as to even staying in one place and talking to guests for any extended length of time. The park rangers need to keep us on the move. We're not allowed to hang around. Gary? I would just say, put your license away, and they don't know who you are. Then you get away with it. Okay. No. No. Number one. You are licensed by the Department of the City of New York Department of Consumer Affairs and Environmental Protection. Your legal requirement is to show that license. And part of Gannick's problem, I'm going to tell you right now, this is one of my long time beats. You hide the fact that you're licensed, guys. Why are you doing that? Put that badge on and show it. Because you don't want to say that you're a crap. That's why. That's why I do Bay of New Jersey, we have 3,000 people coming in every ship. Yeah. And everybody's going, big buses, 50 buses we are going from New Jersey side to both places. Mm -hmm. And nobody ever stopped us and we speak the language. More power to you. And I can have the audio too. We can have what we do individually. But we give to us with this. The whisper language. system, yeah. 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 We're working to make the situation better. That's it? Any more questions? Thank you, everybody. Bring it back! I just want to add my own quick editorial comment there about Patrick, you know, pushing back and getting the city to agree that they're going to keep the sightseeing guide license. You know, it, as you say, it's literally a case of just one person bringing it up to them and being like, oh, we've never heard from a tour guide about this. And this is a big thing in my book, is one of the ways we need to approach these people now is our hand, so to speak, has never been stronger because if you walk around up, you know, downtown Manhattan, like Circa Financial District, World Trade Center, certainly up around Midtown, you know that obviously, you see the stats from NYC and company average weekday, average office building occupancy is around 55% of its 2019 numbers. And pretty much, you know, I when I kind of uh, try to talk about this. I remind people like at this point, tourism is the number one thing holding the downtown and midtown economy together. Uh, you know, like if, again, if, if those if those office buildings are at fifty five percent, and that's a big difference, and that's very much I, I want to add an American problem. Like in most of the big European countries, they're at about ninety ish percent of their two thousand nineteen numbers in terms of office occupancy. This is a, a, a very American kind of issue that's going on, but that makes tourism stronger. You know, we were always, even pre-COVID, one of the top economic industries in terms of impacting the economic bottom line of the city. That has only become more important because while, despite Mayor Adams believing he can just beat people into going to the office and telling like Goldman Sachs, like, you gotta get these people back in there, that's not gonna happen. Once people have been working remote or hybrid for three years, they know that it's BS that they can't keep doing that. Um, but the people, the tourists are gonna keep coming. Revenge tourism, post-COVID, like that, is going to keep going, so tourism is a big thing. So if you are talking to an elected representative, that's actually, in my opinion, the best way to lead is remind them like, what we are doing, the people we're bringing here, we're showing around, this is the reason that New York economy is doing well, because I have traveled a lot since the pandemic began. I've been to uh, San Francisco, Chicago, Boston, and a few other cities, and their tourism is not doing anything like ours is, and you can feel it in the central commercial districts. A lot of those places feel really empty, and as you know, New York does not feel empty, and tourists, and what you guys are all doing, is the reason. So press that. 
Uh, that's a little bit of editorial content yet. We I'm are. Which one my committee? <laughs> it'll be my uh, 17th committee, I think. Then. Uh, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, uh, committee, which is industry relations, which we ran by once again. Here's Bob. Yeah. March was a busy month. Actually, much busier for Harley, who is still not back. Uh, but uh, I attended the annual meeting of the NYC and Co. Uh, in Javits Center early last week with a few of organic members. Susan Birnbaum was there, Kit Garrett was there, and we worked great as a team trying to introduce ourselves to potential industry partners and possibly new organic members and we are following through with all of that. Uh, what was amazing about the convention was there were over 1,000 travel, tourism, and hospitality professionals at the center, and the good news is that New York City is reaching the stats of its benchmark year 2019, and we expect to surpass those numbers by next year. NYC and Co. was also rebranded and renamed, they are now New York City Tourism and Conventions. So you're going to see a lot of marketing campaigns <laughs> now because no one knew what NYC and Co. really was. Was it a city agency? Was it the women's clothing store? Um, but it is not. So they are moving forward and they actually have been incredibly supportive recently of Gannett. Uh, I know I've mentioned this at previous meetings, but from March 5th to March 10th, Harvey went on the Mexican sales program, which was a program inviting different vendors and the Guides Association of New York to four cities in Mexico. Uh, they visited Guadalajara, Monterrey, Mexico City, and Merida, where they met with Mexican companies that bring tourists to New York. And Harvey met with dozens and dozens of people that had never heard of the Guides Association of New York City. One of our members, uh, Paloma Mauro Hernandez, uh, actually translated our organic one pager into Spanish, so Harvey carried that around with him, like his own personal luggage, and distributed it. And what was more impressive during the time that Harvey was in Mexico was the companies that traveled from New York with him. And he got to really talk up Gannick, and he has made inroads. Because since he got back a couple of weeks ago, I had been CC'd on probably about 100 emails. It was so nice to meet you in Guadalajara, and when can we have lunch, and when can you become an industry partner of Gannick? So Harvey is always out there representing us. And also the main thing about that, and why I say NYC and Co. is now very supportive, that every group that went paid $6,000 for the privilege of being a part of the Mexican sales program. We were given a scholarship we did not pay, Ooh. which was wonderful. Um, so we're really happy about that. Harvey's report, which is very extensive, and I am not reading it tonight. <laughs> we will be here through the first SEDA. Uh, will be posted on the Gannick website. You will be able to find it. I'm not sure where it will be, but documents. Jeremy knows. Documents, sounds good. Now, um, also, I just want to announce again our upcoming meeting venues. Again, thank you, Deborah Gilbert and everyone at the Soho Photo Gallery. Uh, May, we will be at the Fort Hamilton Distillery in Industry City, Brooklyn. June, we'll be at the Montour Club in Brooklyn. July, we will be at the Museum of the City of New York. August, we are working on. September, we will return to the Theater Center for our annual general meeting. And October we're working on, but I don't see them. I think they left a little earlier. Uh, I was very fortunate tonight. I had invited two people who were going to be our November speakers. Uh, Liz Hartman is an author, and Michael Horowitz is a photographer. And for years they worked on a book, Sacred Spaces in Manhattan, Churches and Synagogues in this Borough and it's a coffee table book 
that has now been published, and they will be our guest speakers in November, and they have promised me they'll get us to a church or synagogue to have that meeting as we continue to try and match speaker with venue. And additionally, I just want to mention, because it's getting very close to it, uh, we are still looking for a GANIC member who has a luggage and can travel to represent the association at the New York State Travel Industry Association Conference, which is taking place April 19th through the 21st in Oswego, New York. And there is also the Student Youth Travel Associations Conference, which will take place in August in Winnipeg. I may actually go on that unless there's someone who wants to go to Canada instead of me. Uh, so we try to connect, and that's it for this month. Any questions for Bob? All right, so, sorry, so our final committee report for the evening will be the membership committee, uh, and Chair Ann McDermott will be giving that report. First, I want to say, um, we have a member who's outside who has three books about New York. So as you're leaving, if you want to pick up one of these books, he's got them out outside. Uh, Sam Auslander is giving away these books, so how about it? Uh, just let me know. <laughs> so, uh, I am the membership chair. Very, very happy to see everybody here. We, uh, where, how many are we at now, Jeremy? Uh, it's years? around 310. 310, okay. And we have six new provisional members since the beginning of the year. And I want to institute a new little thing at the meetings where you actually meet the new members. So if you've joined GANIC within the last two years, raise your hand. All right, everybody. Yeah, raise them high. Okay, great. So, um, Kyle. Hand, why don't you stand up and just give a little blurb about why you joined GANIC? Um, I'm Kyle. I'm a, I'm a full time paralegal and part time tour guide, but in my heart, those are reversed. And, um, I really joined uh, GANIC just to connect with people and learn more about how to be the best tour guide. So, thanks. And I will just say this it does my 63 year old heart good to see Kyle at Beetlefest. <laughs> It's so nice to see it passed on to the next generation. <laughs> He's a hardcore Beatle fan. Vince, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. Hi, Vince Mean. I joined liability insurance. <laughs> <laughs> Sam Silverman in the back. Tell them about your Bagel Fest. Hey, everybody. I'm Sam. I run Bagel Tours, and I also run a big event called Bagel Fest. The next one, the fourth annual, is going to take place in October. Uh, still searching for a venue, but looking to move it into Manhattan this year and expecting you know, 50 vendors from all over New York and the world and a couple thousand people to come through, eat bagels, drink coffee, smoke fish, you know, the whole nine and just have a great time. So you're all invited. Hope to see you all there. Yeah. Back there, sitting next to you, with the pink hair. The, the, the woman sitting next to you. You want to just... job, fell into tour guiding, and wow, it's the most fun job, I, even though it pays less than a corporate job. I'm also uh, uh, married 29 years, I've had three kids in her 20s, uh, my daughter's getting married in a few months. And, That's uh, a wrap. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm also a retired military, Army oh, Reservist. That's important. 27 years, uh, 11 at active. Six years away from home since September 11th. Uh, I know some people didn't make it that day too. Though. So uh, I give my wife more credit. She's one of the kids. I'm all looking like a hero. Uh, men have it easy. 
Uh, that, uh, anyway, I just looking to start my own tour company, do my own tours that I, I think are really unique in particular, so I'd like to. Patrick. Patrick. Sure, yeah, I talked to many of you a couple months ago. I was a speaker, I probably said enough then. Uh, but uh, I worked for 10 years as a guard at the Met, and I'm doing these tours at the Met. I just had this book come out about all the beauty in the world. Um, if you're interested in the book too, even if you didn't bring it, I, I brought cards that I can sign that you can put it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But thanks very much. Uh, I, I gave fam tours to some of you too. It's been great. Thank you. So we're going to do a couple of interviews after this meeting with some new uh, potential members, so you'll meet us somewhere. The board will meet you somewhere. Just look for look for me. Um, and what else did I want to say? Oh, thank you so much for your beautiful thing you're doing for Soho. Uh, I have been involved in preservation for like a couple of years, and I know how Soho has been embattled, and um, I just it just does my heart good because it's one of my favorite neighborhoods. And as I said, my father went to high school there. St. Al's, class of 46. Uh, so that's it. Um, and that's it, Jeremy. <laughs> and I would add, obviously, in terms of, uh, you are all sort of unofficial members of the membership committee in that, you know, one of the main ways when we interview people, we like, how like how did you hear about Gannick? How did you come to join? They heard about it from another Gannick member. Sometimes they just found us through Google, which is always fun. But, uh, you know, if you know a guy and you think like they want this kind of group and networking or they just want liability insurance, uh, uh, we are we are more than happy to, uh, to, uh, to welcome them and to keep growing as an organization. Uh, so that is it for committee chairs. Is there any new new business suit, uh, suit cats in the back? I see yes. We've been trying to do this in the uh, the winter months, obviously when people are working less. So the most recent course wrapped up right around the same time as the awards. Uh, um, oh, Kristen, you had a hand up. Hi, guys. Well, it's not, I'm not new. <laughs> <laughs> Give tours in multiple languages. Hi, so um, my name is Kristen Singleton Ferrari. Maybe Ferrari is short enough time more. Um, but I'm, uh, I think it's an Italian speaking tour guide here with the association. I've been a tour guide last month was 13 years. So, unfortunately, I just like crazy. But um, I know that the multilingual guides kind of committee, um, I was uh, very involved, maybe not six or seven years ago, and um, I realized that it's a hard thing for a lot of us to speak other languages. Some of the regulations, how we get paid, what we're getting paid, you know, where we're going, a lot of us do um, uh, on the road tours, etc. and I just would like to help from my experience. As a tour guide, I do tours in 26 cities now, and um, for New York City, covering the five boroughs, if that's what you need, then we can help. Uh, German, you know, Italian, French, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, all the languages that I know we're all on tour buses that we can do. Um, Y'all can contact me at Kristen's tours, and um, I gave wine to the. Yeah, you know To the Gary Awards, so I'm a wino. <laughs> um, I don't have wine, so yeah. <laughs> I'm a wine store in Brooklyn, and um, you know anything that y'all need to come up for, I'd like to start the committee getting itself moving again. All right, thank you. We will be in the middle of the time. All right, so um, uh, uh, we can have one, just one more quick question. Uh, AJ, do you have something you want to add? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second on that motion? There's a second. All in favor? Yes. Okay. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, those of you who are going to be interviewing me right up here. Thank you.